Good evening. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. With me, I have good friend Henry Pietras, who's been with us many times over the last six or seven months talking about um, the Democratic Party, about uh, the direction it's headed, about our candidate of choice, Bernie Sanders, about Hillary Clinton, about Donald Trump, about everything of the political scene that seems to have consumed us for, uh, for a long time now. But I want to mention, before we get started, about um, our thoughts and prayers being with, um, with uh, people in uh, Dallas, uh, our friends in, uh, in Dallas and Baton Rouge and Minneapolis, and, and we hope that um, both police officers and black citizens can live without fear of each other or without fear of being being targeted. I mean, it's it's difficult being a police officer in America. It's tough tough being a, a black citizen in America, and we're hoping that uh, we can uh, get through this. Um, this I guess we used to call it a long hot summer about um, where people have to um, people have to worry not about more than just the heat. But um, I'd like to introduce um, Henry Pietras, a uh, good friend of the show, and uh, we'll get started on our discussion about the, uh, the Democratic Party platform. Henry, would you like to identify yourself? Who are you? What brought you to this point in time? And uh, mm-hmm. then, we'll get, then we'll get moving on the, on the subject. I'm, I'm Henry Pietras. I've been involved in... Uh Politics for about a year, ever since Bernie announced. That's about my extent of uh, being involved in, uh, in what's going on politically in this area. We've done about 90 events on behalf of Bernie in this area. Uh, that included, includes Breakfast for Bernie, which we do at uh, Brookfield Panera, uh, every Saturday morning from 9 to 11 now, instead of 8. We finally yielded to... Uh, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so we are start, start at nine, and that conversation will continue no matter what happens. Uh, and we have been doing a, uh, a rally for Bernie, uh, a veterans rally for Bernie at um, at uh, uh, Rogers Park in Danbury, and we will. Uh, I think this will be uh, um, this weekend if we do it. It will be the last one, um, and then we've done a whole bunch of. Uh, phone banks as well as um, canvassing and uh, uh, video conferences with the Bernie campaign and we've even done d- debate watches. So uh, I would say easily 90 events or so for, on behalf of Bernie. The response at the uh, Rogers Park uh, event has been very positive even now. Uh, seldom do we get uh, a Trump, Trump, Trump. Never do we get any Hillary. And uh, it's always go Bernie. And that's very, very uh, encouraging because no matter what happens, the conversation needs to continue. The conversation about money and politics does not go away. The conversation about our environment does not go away. And the conversation about uh, Glass-Steagall does not go away. Uh, among, um, among the whole slew of... Um, issues that Bernie has talked about in his platform. Uh, amazingly, I just recently read a book called by, by uh, Joseph E. Stiglitz, and it's about the Great Divide. And I would say, if I didn't know any better, I would say that most of the stuff that Bernie is talking about came from this book. And while we intuitively understand what Bernie is talking about, this man who is a Nobel laureate uh, economist uh, provides the data behind the the intuitive uh, feelings that we have what's going on in this country. And the biggest focus that he has is on inequality. And inequality from different uh, perspectives, one being opportunity. Uh, inequality in uh, in the way people earn their income and in, uh, in the environment and justice whatever um, um, you can think of any area of concern there's an inequality where people do not start though we'd like to think that everyone starts at the same level we do not and in many cases the uh, including the democratic race have been skewed towards a favored candidate 
uh, with superdelegates as well as with all the uh, goings-on in, in the um, caucuses as well as in the primaries. And um, that's an in- inequality as well. And uh, we need to fix it. And I think despite what's happening now, I think Bernie is still asking us to continue the conversation. And well, we talked about that. In fact, um, we've been talking on that notion all through the campaign and the overarching theme being that um, no matter what happens in the primary, and we did, we got 45, 46% of the pledged delegates, the delegates that were earned through caucuses and, and, and uh, primaries, and uh, that is, that's a huge chunk of uh, support that we have. Mm-hmm. And we're going to go f- probably late in our first show, maybe in our show tomorrow, our second show that will be aired tomorrow, Thursday. And we'll talk about um, where do we go from here and, and the plans that we've, behind the scenes that we've been making all through the primaries and the caucuses, knowing pretty well that it would be very difficult to achieve the lofty goal of our candidate getting the, um, getting the nom- nomination of, from the party. Mm. So we've, we've been gearing up for this, and, uh, and our candidate has been talking about this throughout the entire process, about um, picking up and moving forward. Now, a little bit of history. This is nothing new in America, this, this notion of inequality. It happens periodically. You get into these situations. Uh, the Industrial Revolution brought on a lot of this uh, where you had um, kids, kids at the age of 10 working in, uh, in factories, um, in coal factories, combing through the coal. You had all kinds of horrible things foisted upon Americans by, um, by those who were the uber-wealthy and didn't, uh, didn't stop enough to think about what, um, what the consequences were for, for making the poor even poorer and the wealthy uh, just a touch wealthier. So we're going to come back and we'll get into that in our, in our late, late in today's show or early in tomorrow's show and talk about it. But from another perspective, 2004, we had, um, we had a candidate named Howard Dean, as it turns out, also from Vermont, who um, didn't get too far into the, um, into the primary process. He, um, uh, maybe about 10 or 12 primaries, and, and then, uh, you know, we didn't have the kind of money, we didn't raise the kind of money back then that uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign has raised this time. So in, um, in uh, late, uh, late February, Howard Dean dropped out of the race, took a month off and came back and began a little organization, and I say little facetiously because it's not a little organization called Democracy for America that um, has over a million members and Democracy America for Democracy for America has carried on the good work of progressives that evolved out of that campaign and has been very much active in the Sanders campaign, very much active in the Democratic Party to try to keep the party in a, tr- in a traditional Democratic Party sense, not in this corporate sense, which we seem to be uh, knocking heads with this year, but in a more progressive sense, a more sense of uh, working for the good of everyone, not just the few. But, okay, so you have the book about, by Joseph Stiglitz, A Great Divide, um, which I, I think pretty much encapsulates the kind of things that, um, that our candidate, Bernie Sanders, has been talking about for 40 years. I mean, there's mm-hmm. nothing new under the sun there. He's, um, he's been on, his focus has been on all these issues for, um, for a very long time. And uh, we'll stay focused on them as long as it takes to, um, to get the party and get the country back in a, in a more equitable sense. So, the party platform. We, um, tell us about the specific things that are contained in that platform. Mm-hmm. The, things, the things that we, uh, that we negotiated on and where we ended up in those negotiations. Well, Bernie held out uh, endorsing Hillary for a reason because, you know, he had uh, a delegate count of around 1,900 and still going up as returns still come in. Mm -hmm. California, Um, yep. So he held out um, because if he didn't, then he would have been giving his leverage away. And, um, you know, so he tried to impact the platform both on on the three platforms 
committees that were set up. Mm-hmm. Which were? Well, they were uh, the platform, they were the rules and regulation, and finally the, uh, uh, the credentials. I think uh, on C-SPAN they ran quite a bit of the uh, uh, negotiations and uh, the event itself. Uh, uh, last Sunday I, I watched it. Uh, and it, it was an interesting process because a lot of this stuff happens. All the wording for all these platforms happens way ahead of time, and um, they were actually allowing us to to have a sneak peek as to how the different groups were uh, were negotiating and working with each other. I mean, that's basically uh, you know the one thing that we as a nation have forgotten, which is negotiations. Um, you know, you give in a little in order to get a little. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, uh, with the Democratic and Republican situation we currently have, it's, you know, you're not negotiating unless you move in to the other side completely. And that's not negotiating because, you know, the other side will resent you and try to get even going forward or next time. So um, it was interesting to watch. Bernie didn't get everything he wanted. He got a lot of the stuff on, on the environment. Uh, got a lot on, uh, well, he did get the uh, $15 minimum wage mm-hmm. and uh, also some adjustment on, on universal health care, uh, but not everything. Uh, and uh, the worst um, performance, I think, in terms of the platform was the, um, was the TPP, in that for whatever reason, yep. we do know that uh, Bernie was against the TPP, Mm-hmm. Hillary claimed that she was against the TPP. Yep, she came around on that. So that's the, uh, 11 uh, members out of the uh, 15 that are on the platform committee, including the two co-chairs. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, the TPP was uh, was okay, as it is. So they kept the, the endorsement of the Trans-Pacific Partnership in... Uh as is, which that's, is which doesn't make a lot of sense considering that's gonna be that. A, yeah, that's going to be. So a tough then the thought. question becomes: Well, who, who's managing this? Mm-hmm. If it's you know, if it's eleven candidates who are technically for it, and the DNC has four um, delegates, uh, then who's overturning this and saying, okay, it's okay as is? And we've got a candidate on the other side. Uh, dare I um, dare I say his name, Donald Trump? That um, that in spite of all the misogynistic and racist things that he says and all the horrible things that he says, um, I would think the majority of Americans appear to be on the side that he purports to be for, and that's against trade, trade agreements. And I, and I say I think he's against but because, well, he's been everywhere on every issue, and I believe as a Wall Street guy, as a guy who's, who's amongst the folks that are going to benefit the most from the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, that um, I do doubt his sincerity about being against trade agreements. I, I just can't, it just doesn't, uh, it just doesn't ring true with his, um, with his statements in the past, and it doesn't ring true with, with what he represents. The, um, he represents Wall Street and uh, the worst he can say about uh, candidate Clinton is that um, it's she uh, she kowtows to Wall Street. Well, gosh, she maybe if she kowtows to Wall Street, he is Wall Street. So um, I still think that puts her, puts her a little bit in a little bit better position um, with with what's right and wrong than, than he is. But that that one issue, he's got that issue to um, to hammer away with hmm. with his claim that he's uh, that he's against all trade agreements. Well, he claims he's got these super negotiators there. All of a sudden, they're going to overturn everything that, that's that been negotiated in place and uh, put something better in. But, you know, it takes two parties to negotiate. Yeah. I think in The Wizard of Oz, they call that flying monkeys. Yeah. Because really, in <laughs> fact, it's it's what it amounts to is that um, he's got this and he's got that and he's got this and he's got that. But, but nobody really knows what he's got. Yeah. Nobody really knows what he stands for. And... And essentially, that's that's uh, the problem that um, that a lot of American voters have with Hillary Clinton, is that um, nobody, she's been a lot of places on a lot of issues. She's been core democratic values on a lot of social issues, certainly, but on economic issues, 
on bread and butter issues. She's been a lot of places on those issues. And uh, good friend John Stewart of The Daily Show, no longer The Daily Show, but he had The Daily Show for 15 years, he wrote a good op-ed piece where, with all due respect, he said the problem he has with Hillary Clinton is he doesn't know what she believes in. And he's not sure if she knows what, what she actually believes in. Yeah. And that runs concurrent with the problem with Trump, because Trump's been everywhere on every issue. And this may be the whole, over, the whole arcing overview of why American voters have cast these two candidates as a true to least trustworthy candidates of all the 20 or 25 candidates that started off this election cycle yeah. on both sides, both parties. Well, if I can turn around and, mm-hmm. and look at this platform yeah. and assume that it's a set of promises, yeah. Okay, then the question becomes, how confident are we that those promises will be kept? Or even worked towards. Yeah. I mean, is it, is, just, is it a way to shut up what Bernie is trying to get at? Or is it a serious attempt to, uh, to move forward in a, lot of dire- in a direction that we, as a nation, have to move in? Uh, you know, without a planet, we've got nothing. All the other stuff is, mm. is, 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 is useless. It I goes mean. by the wayside. That's, yeah. that's the basis. And, uh, so, you know, that's just not from a... That's just not from a, a liberal point of view, but that's from an evangelical point of view, because evangelicals consider themselves true to form to be, uh, to be caretakers of the planet. Yeah, that's but their, um, and I understand a lot of this stuff has to be uh, compromised, and uh, you know, obviously we have to take care of our planet in the, in the best way we can. Um, you know, there's an opportunity in, in, in doing clean energy, for instance. Uh, you know, and the party of business, for some reason, just doesn't get it. That, you know, they could be making a lot of money if they behave in clean manners and everyone else behaves in, clean, in a clean manner. So, Tremendous opportunities. Tremendous opportunities yeah. to, to do the right thing and yeah. make a profit doing yeah. it at the same time. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's capitalism at its best, is doing the right thing and then figuring out a way for investors to make money doing it. Sure. And that, that's reasonable. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I haven't heard a lot about um, money in politics. Hmm. Did you hear any, did you see anything on the platform that said, you know, we're going to revisit big money in politics? I did not see that. I know that there was a speech that, uh, that Hillary Clinton gave pretty soon after California. It was about, going, it's going back about three weeks now. And in that speech... She really, in fact, went over a litany of good things that uh, that, uh, we progressives have been fighting for for years and certainly fighting for in this campaign. And she said a lot of very good things. Hmm. It just, we just need to to sit back and watch and find out, decide whether we can take her at her word and whether she'll actually do what she seems to be for. I'm, and I'm not saying that I'm not saying that she's a bad person. She's a, I think she's a good person, but I think uh, this whole notion of money and politics has really tainted our country badly. And even the Republican side, even even Donald Trump, who started off with his uh, "I'm going to finance my own campaign" uh, stuff that that he went with it that that gained him a lot of votes. All of a sudden, as soon as he had the um, as soon as he had the um, the nomination or presumed nomination, he's out talking to um, Sheldon Edelman and a, and a lot of other very wealthy people. He's doing the same things that he, that he criticized Clinton for. Hmm. So really the only, candidate, the only candidates that really stood back and criticized Trump and Clinton equally on that were, well, I'll say Bernie Sanders, but I'll also say probably to a great degree a fellow by the name of John Kasich, who was my personal favorite amongst all the Republican candidates. Um, there's a fellow by the name of Gary Johnson, and maybe we could spend a little time talking about libertarian candidate Gary Johnson, because uh, if you remember back to, um, to uh, 1992, when you had three principal candidates in the presidential election, you had, uh, of course, you had Bill Clinton, you had uh, George H.W. Bush, and a fellow named Ross Perot. And Ross Perot did very well. And uh, 
in that election, he took probably more energy and more votes away from George H.W. Bush, consequently giving Bill Clinton the opportunity to um, to make it to the president's presidential uh, to make it to the White House. Mm. Um, Gary Johnson, I think, probably since there are a lot of Republicans who have a libertarian bent, it's almost the wing of the party. We call it the Ron Paul wing of the Republican Party. Gary Johnson is um, is a pretty good candidate to take a look at. He's been very critical of Donald Trump. In fact, uh, referring to things he said as being racist. And in fact, I think actually going so far as, as saying saying he is a racist based on the uh, based on things he said. You know, you can only judge him by judge a person by what they do and what they say. But uh, uh, Gary Johnson has been very critical of, of of Donald Trump along the way. Um, Back to, the, um, back to the platform. Mm-hmm. Specific things we talked about in the platform and uh, where, we, where we got to on those issues. You mentioned the $15 an hour uh, um, concession. The concession, because Clinton had actually been for, she threw out the number $12 an hour mm-hmm. as a generic number that she thought would be a fair minimum wage increase. Okay. Later on, Toward the end of the um, of the, the primaries and the caucuses, she she leaned a little bit more in the direction of Bernie Sanders on that, as well as of course on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and a lot of other things. But um, so now we've got the Democratic Party actually having a call in the party platform of a fifteen dollar an hour hour yep. pay pay uh, pay increase. Of course, mind you. This, these things don't happen immediately. Nobody ever expected them to. But one of the questions that evolve around that, uh, that party platform about $15 an hour is how quickly do we get there? Whether we get there in, in dribs and drabs and still stay so far behind that our, that our folks that work at McDonald's and Burger King and Walmart and all the other places that, um, that push their employees onto public, the need for public assistance because they don't pay them enough. How quickly this all happens? Well, in most, I, I don't know about the platform itself, but over, they're always talking about anywhere between, like, anywhere between a year to five years mm-hmm. from now. The reality is that putting in a number on any of this is, is personally rather silly because what's the point of coming up with $15 an hour when uh, you know half of your wage goes towards uh, living accommodations, yeah. okay, uh, plus food, plus insurance, and everything else you need, uh, fifteen dollars an hour doesn't go far away. If you work two thousand hours a year, which is two thousand and eighty to be exact, um, that's roughly thirty thousand dollars a year. Take out taxes, that's twenty five. Uh, any reasonable house or apartment is a thousand dollars. I can speak to that as a local realtor in that um, in our market area, a thousand dollars a month is pretty much threshold bottom. That's bottom of, of a rental a rental place. If someone can get can has, has good credit and, and enough income, they can get a mortgage. A thousand dollars is kind of bottom of the barrel as far as being able to to own or to rent. Okay, but that's for around here. Now go to New York City. There you go. That's much higher. Okay. Some, some, some places it's lower, but certainly in New York City it's considerably higher. And then you have food, transportation, yep. insurance, and uh, clothing, and everything else that comes in. It's, it's not a living wage. Yeah. You need to figure about um, what uh, landlords look at in the same way as, uh, as lenders look at in order to, to qualify for a mortgage. Landlords look at things pretty much the same way. They figure that somewhere between 35, maximum 45%, of your before tax income should go towards your housing expense, and that would be, you know, house, uh, utilities, um, mm. anything that goes into your housing expenses. And, uh, and when you got a thousand dollar rent for one person, that's, um, that's, that requires a pretty sizable salary to avoid being forced to look for public assistance. And when I say public assistance, I mean, the rest of us, taxpayers, we foot the bill because corporations do not pay someone a living wage. So 
to, to fight against, to fight against a, a fair living wage is in fact cutting off our nose to spite our face. It's fighting against ourselves as taxpayers because we end up get fitting the bill that corporations should be paying for. Yeah, so we're subsidizing them. We're subsidizing them, exactly. about corporate welfare? That's, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. It's corporate welfare. So we're, yeah. we're footing something that, that in order to get people a decent, head over, a decent roof over their head for themselves or for their families, uh, food on the table, and transportation to and from work, it just doesn't, the numbers just don't add up. Yeah. Now, two, I got hit from two different angles recently about this idea of, uh, again, inequality, but from the viewpoint of uh, demand mm -hmm. and that our economy is really based on demand. Everything revolves on demand. Yep. And Stiglitz makes the case that, you know, if, if, yeah. if there is, if, if there are, how can you have demand if there are no jobs and people have no money? Mm -hmm. So he's making the case that it behooves those who have the money and who are hoarding the money. Is He's making the case that we should have those people spread the wealth. Mm -hmm. Okay, Because in the long run, they benefit. Because as people get money, they spend more money, and therefore they make more money. We've talked about that many times on many shows over the six years we've been on, in the sense that a um, fellow by the name of Henry Ford, who was no angel by any means, but Henry Ford, had Ford Motor Company, um, understood that he needed to pay his workers enough money so they could afford a Ford. Because otherwise, how can the company do better if you don't have a market? We're going to um, we're gonna have to break off from there, and we're going to have to uh, come back. We'll come back and do a second show, which will be tomorrow. Uh, of course, you're watching this show at 9.30 Wednesday night. You'll see the follow-up show tomorrow, uh, Thursday at, at noon 30, Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson. Henry Pietras, thank you for watching.